What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ some 2,000 years removed from those events that we read in the pages of the Bible? I mean, what is it? Does it take to become a genuine follower of Jesus? Well, we read in the first chapter of John, those who received Jesus, those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And so you read throughout Jesus' ministry where he says, I will make you fishers of men. He speaks of himself, unless you eat this, my flesh and drink my blood, I am the bread of life. He said, you have no life in you. I am the bread of life. And he says, when I'm lifted up, crucified, I will draw all people to myself. When, the resurrect when Jesus was resurrected, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go. And so he's, for the last 2,000 years, the phenomenal rise of Christianity has been simply a case of people responding to Jesus' call. And what does that call look like for you? And how do we understand it today in allowing the call of Christ in your life to manifest itself and bear the fruits of not only just repentance, but also as a witness and a testimony to this extraordinary hope that you have of living forever as a son of God. Calling is important. And for many of us, we know, and we can look back on the roadmap of our lives and see God's hand, where certain circumstances and various people have come into our lives and made an impact by living their lives as a testimony. And I know that when I was a boy, I asked certain questions that I never had adequate answers for until some 30 or 40 years later. And we find this also in the life of Christ. When Jesus was a 12-year-old boy, his family traveled to Jerusalem as they did annually for the Passover season. And when the big caravan of people headed out from Jerusalem, Joseph and Mary noticed that Jesus wasn't among them. So they headed back to Jerusalem and spent three days searching for Jesus and found him in the temple among the teachers and the priests, listening and asking questions. And Mary says to Jesus, well, why have you caused us so much consternation? And Jesus responded, he says, didn't you know that I need to be in my father's house? The scripture says Mary didn't know what to do with that, but treasure these things in her heart. And then Jesus travels with the rest of the family. But the point made here is that even at 12 years of age, there's a level of understanding and mission that even though Jesus was conceived of Mary by the Holy Spirit in a most unique way to reflect that he is the Son of God as well as the Son of Man, the Saviour, the Messiah promised to come into the world who redeem us from the sin penalty, it nonetheless illustrates Jesus the Messiah um, as recorded in the book of Luke, distinctly asking questions and confounding the religious leaders by his answers. And I think it's very powerful because when then Jesus, after he's baptised, we read that he's in his hometown of Nazareth at the age of 30. And he's in the synagogue on the Saturday and they gave him the uh, book of Isaiah, the scroll of Isaiah to read. And he unrolls it to a particular point and he quotes from Isaiah that he was appointed, anointed to preach good news to the poor, to give recovery of sight to the blind, to proclaim liberty to the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And so Jesus then knew who he was, he knew what his purpose was, and he set about over the next three and a half years mentoring and equipping those young men, those 12 young men, to be about his will and his word, and so that many others would believe on account of their testimony. And the phenomenal rise of Christianity against all the odds of, of of persecution and of, of the wickedness of the world and the Bible burning and all kinds of things throughout 2,000 years of history has meant that Christianity still persists as the largest religion and the, and the greatest hope that any human being could ever have to realize that we're not a biological accident happening in the universe. We were intentionally created in God's image and likeness to be God's children. The reason sin came in the world was because of the devil. The Messiah came and redeems us from that certain death penalty by his own blood, attributes to us his righteousness, and then calls us to be image bearers of Christ, to be his hands, ears, eyes, and heart in a world desperately needing saving, in a world desperately needing hope. So what does it mean for you and I to be a disciple of Jesus today and to be about his will and work 
as his ears, as his eyes, as his heart, as his hands, as his mouths, as we speak and invest our lives in the lives of others until Jesus Christ returns. Well, when Jesus was resurrected, after being in the grave for three days and three nights, he looks at his disciples and he tells them something significant. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Teach him to observe everything that I've taught you and baptize them. And we see throughout the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament, six examples where people were baptized in the name of Jesus. They experienced the calling, the power of the Holy Spirit in their life. They repented of their sins and they said, Jesus, I surrender all. I surrender all. What next? And this is a really good question to answer. What does it look like 2,000 years removed from that to be a genuine disciple of Jesus, to be immersed in Christ, to be obedient to his word, to have surrendered all, and then to bear a powerful witness and testimony to this world, to this age, to the people all around you. And so there's two aspects of this within the body of Christ, church life. There's the aspect of evangelism and the area of edification. Evangelism is the first point of contact. Taste and see that the Lord is good, that God is and that he exists and he invites all people into fellowship. And edification is the teaching, the mentoring, the equipping and the discipling, pastoral training, all the opportunities for growing and maturing in the image and likeness of Jesus so that you and I, our epitaph can be a testimony to the glory of God written by the blood of Jesus and in the name of Jesus. Now there are certain realities and I don't want to sugarcoat this. The greatest calling that you could ever have is to be hear the voice of Jesus, to respond to his spirit, to surrender all and live your life as a testimony to God's glory. But it's not easy. We live in an adversarial world. All the saints that have gone before us have suffered, genuinely suffered, because this world was not their home. They looked forward to the kingdom of God, the heavenly promises of eternity, with no more mourning or tears or suffering or death. But in this age, a disciple of Jesus is synonymous with suffering. In fact, Christianity today is noted as being the most persecuted religion. Jesus says in as recorded by Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. What does it mean to deny yourself? Well, there are a lot of distractions in the world, entertainment and the pleasures and the busyness of life. To deny yourself, to take up your cross, the instrument of suffering whereby you face the jeering crowds and follow Jesus. And then Jesus said to his disciples, he said, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, you need to be wise and innocent. And so there was no illusion in those the minds of those first century disciples as to the nature and the challenges of the calling that Jesus was inviting them into. Jesus says, I have said these things to you, in John chapter 16, verse 33, that in me you may have peace. Because, in his next breath he says, in this world you will have tribulation, trouble, persecution, but take heart, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So he tells us and equips us in readiness that this is no mean feat task. If they've listened to me, they'll listen to you. If they've persecuted me, they'll persecute you. This is the calling to Christ, the nature of it. And the Apostle Paul, when he wrote the letter many years later to those at Philippi, he lets those in Philippi know that their suffering is not without reason or purpose or cause. For it had been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, very easy to believe in Jesus in one sense, but also suffer for his sake. How genuine are you for what you believe in? Because scripture tells us that even the demons believe and tremble, but they're not prepared to suffer, to repent, to submit the high calling that we have. Now, 
You can say, well, that's, you know, I don't really want to face suffering in my life. But there's an element of suffering that if you understand the purpose of what you're experiencing, you can have an internal confidence and a sense of mission and destiny that can really be substituted for the word joy. Suffering is not, doesn't make you happy. But you can have a peace of mind and a sense of destiny that can be parallel with joy, that there is meaning and purpose and you're willing to forego the fleeting pleasures of sin and the, and the easy way out to hear the call of God. This joy in suffering is where we record in the book of Hebrews where Jesus, in, for the joy that he understood of what the future held, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising its shame. And now he's seated at the right hand of God in heaven. So he knew his purpose, the great accomplishment and satisfaction that his life sacrifice would mean, and he willingly submitted to his nails being crucified to that post, that cross. And then Jesus speaks to those of us who are followers today who have received Jesus, who believe in his name, who take a deep breath and says, I'll go, Lord, no matter what it takes. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will be with you to the end of the age. And that is true for all of Jesus, the Lord's followers. If you go back in the Old Testament, the Lord didn't take Daniel out of the lion's den. He allowed him to go to the lion's den. A moment of apprehension on the day Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, but the Lord then shut the mouths of the lions. Shedrick, Meshach and Abednego were thrown into a fiery furnace. The Lord didn't stop them from going into such tribulation. But an angel of the Lord was there with them. So remember, no matter how difficult times are, you're not on your own. Because I couldn't endure suffering for, for some higher cause on my own. But God says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you. The psalmist says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it looks dark, it looks terrible. I will fear no ill, for you are with me. Ah, when you know that you're not alone, and the one who died for you has, loves you and is with you, and then you can be like David in the Psalms, as recorded in, in 2 Samuel. The Lord is my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. He's my rock whom, in whom I take my refuge. He's my shield. What beautiful metaphors for the relationship and the confidence that we can have in God's providence. My stronghold, my refuge, my saviour. You save me from violence. It's very encouraging. When David was anointed to be king of Israel, he knew his sense of destiny. But until he was crowned, he spent many years as a fugitive, fleeing for his life, suffering at the wanton of the incumbent, at the, at the wanton nature of the incumbent. That's another story. I know that at the end of our days, we have a certainty of hope and that the, the glorious resurrection to see the face and hear the voice of our Maker, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, will be the most joyous, most rewarding moment one could ever imagine. Apostle Paul was signing off from his life to the younger elder Timothy, and he says, I've fought the fight, I've run the race, I have kept the faith. And Paul was an older man, and he knew what suffering now lay ahead from him. He says, I know there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Not maybe, I know I'm saved by grace through faith and not of works. And this crown of righteousness, the Lord, the righteous judge, will not only award me on that day, but also to all who've loved his appearing. So for the suffering and the challenges of being about the mission of Jesus Christ on this earth, always hold on to the, the vision, the certainty, where the Lord will look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant, my son. The question is, are we up to the task? Are our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? Are we prepared to step out in courage, clarity, faith, and yes, be willing to suffer, 
to uphold and live our lives as a testimony to the name of Jesus Christ? That's the question that we have, must answer. And I pray in the name of Jesus, more willing laborers will confess to Christ and step on board to say, Lord, here I am, send me.